it's a good showing. I think we've got a couple of people on YouTube live there. Um, so I'm uh, Jacob Hickman. I'm an associate professor of anthropology here in the Department of Anthropology. How many of you are anthropology majors? Okay, everybody. Okay. Uh, there is a YouTube chat thing. If you're out there in YouTube land, you want to send me a message or whatever, I am monitoring the chat over on this other computer. So feel free to throw questions out there. Uh, this will be, if you want to go back to any information, because I'm going to say things that are really important, uh, you can check that. The, the link is on my website, which I'll show you in just a second. But we're obviously here to talk about the Northern Ireland Visual Anthropology Field School. Given that you are all majors, are you an anthropology major? I'm, they didn't approve my double major, but yes. I'm ah, well, long story, I'll talk to you after that. The secret there is you take the classes and then you ask that's, again. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> As if none of you are smart enough to figure that out anyway. Um, so yeah, we'll consider you for all intents and purposes an anthropology major. So you all know the field school requirement. We don't need to talk about that. Uh, but if you have friends and other majors that are overlap with anthropology and film photography or, you know, uh, sound work, you know, feel free to let them know. Um, I'm probably hoping to take a group of about, let's say, 10 to 15. Um, uh, not much bigger than that. Um, so I, at this point, have get, had manifest interest from a group of about 20 students. Um, the application is not up yet. Uh, we can actually check. It might have gone up today. I, I haven't checked, but they promised me it hasn't. Okay. Okay. I'm glad you're all checking. <laughs> There's a process by which the Kennedy Center communications people have to approve the web page before it goes live, but they've also told me they could give me a link directly to the website or to the application. As soon as I get that, I will send that to you. Are you all on that email list where I was announcing this meeting? I assume. Okay, so I will send it out to that list of 19 or so emails, okay? So uh, basically the purpose of this meeting is kind of me to give you a little bit of a spiel about the program and uh, give you as much information as I can in addition to maybe fill out some of the details from what you maybe have seen on my website. I tried to get my web page updated quite a bit over the last couple of uh, last week or so. So some of that information is out there and then maybe to answer some other questions. But uh, so let's talk about it for just a second. So Northern Ireland as a field site, uh, well, uh, maybe step back just a second. I have directed eight study or, or field school programs that locations have included Northern Ireland in 2018. I had a group of 13 students, I think, there uh, in 2018. Uh, most of, It's the first non-Mong-centric program that I've run. So I'm a Southeast Asianist. Uh, first and foremost, so I work with Hmong people. I've done Hmong-centric field schools in uh, several of them in Thailand, in Vietnam, China, in France. Um, am I missing any other locations? And then we've done the, the program in Belfast. I also ran a field school uh, that was a virtual field school during the pandemic. That's one of those eight programs, but it was a full-blown field school, even though everybody's doing everything over Zoom. Um, but Northern Ireland is just... Uh, there's a couple of things here. I started going to Northern Ireland because of one of my colleagues, uh, one of my closest friends and colleagues, Joe Webster, which if you come on this program, you'll get to know him, lives in Belfast. And I was going to collaborate with him on several theoretical topics. So I study new religious movements, like basically apocalyptic religious movements. If you're interested in that, I'm teaching a seminar entitled The End of the World Next Semester, mm -hmm. The End of the World as We Know It. Um, but I started going there, collaborating with him, and his work is on Northern Ireland and Scotland. Um, and we had we were seeing similar things in the Hmong world and in the sort of hyper uh, hyper Christian, like hardcore Calvinist Christian world that he studies. So he's an anthropologist of Christianity. Um, and but in going there and collaborating with Joe on all these topics, I kind of fell in love with the place because I just started spending time there talking to people doing kind of informal ethnography and in my trips there uh, and decided that this would be a fantastic comparative field site because on the one hand northern ireland is so familiar i mean you don't have to learn another language they speak english there um, but it's also incredibly foreign in the sense that the entire like <clears throat> social political religious sphere revolves around and still in meaningful it doesn't revolve around necessarily 
but for several decades really revolved around what we call the troubles, namely the political and violent conflict between um, Irish Republicans on the one hand and uh, unionist loyalists on the other hand, right? So basically ident largely identifying as English and British Protestants and then Irish Catholics, right? So from 1968 up to 1998, there's basically a 30 year period of just regular violence, right? We're talking about bombings in the streets. We're talking about indiscriminate shooting, very active paramilitary groups. And one of the interesting things is you go through Belfast and I'll show you some photos. This history looms large. And when I say it looms large, I'm talking about three story buildings with murals of guys wearing balaclavas and carrying like machine guns, right? Like kind of glorifying in some ways this past and so while there's not regular violence uh, in the way that there was during the Troubles, this conflict still lives on. And Brexit, and we won't get into that, but Brexit has reignited it in, in meaningful ways. But Belfast is just an incredible place. It's a visually stimulating place. I'll show you some images of the wall art. So this is actually an, a mural that's on a 40-foot peace wall that to this day separates Protestant from religious uh, or from Protestant from Catholic neighborhoods. Uh, the schools are still 90% segregated between Protestant and Catholic kids. So this kind of gives you a sense of how while the troubles aren't, is a thing of the past, it still is very much part and parcel of the fabric of everyday life in, in Northern Ireland. <clears throat> and uh, we'll talk about a lot of that. But basically, long story short, I fell in love with this place uh, and started becoming interested in it, not just personally, I guess, but professionally as an anthropologist and in studying a lot of these religious dynamics that are similar in many ways to the stuff that I study in the Hmong world. So that, that kind of gives you context for why a Southeast Asianist is going back to sort of like, I guess, uh, you know, I would claim Ireland as a secondary field site or Northern Ireland as a secondary field site at this point, having spent as much time as I have there. And so, you know, when uh, Brenda and I were figuring out where we we're, where in the world we were going to basically set up shop to take students, we, we really wanted to go back here for uh, a whole host of professional and personal reasons. So uh, it really is a delightful place. Like despite this violent history, people are so just folksy and nice. And it's just, it's an amazing place for so many reasons. Anyway, if you don't know where Northern Ireland is, this is the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom is a country made up of four countries, right? You have England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. And Northern Ireland is of course, this little piece right here, which is, kind of chunked off from the Republic of Ireland. And the fact that it's, whoops, the fact that it's not formally part of the Republic of Ireland, therein lies the problem, right? The Irish Catholics want to be reunited with the Republic. Uh, the Protestants very much want to remain part of the United Kingdom. And that's more or less the story of the Troubles. So quickly, a couple of words of what is a field school. I probably don't need to talk about this a ton, but because it's going on YouTube, just a couple of words for people coming from other disciplines. A field school is not just a study abroad program. We call it a field school, not a study abroad, because we're not just going to study in an interesting place and take regular coursework. The place is the text in a sense, right? So a field school is all about embedding yourself in the community uh, becoming a part of that community to a large extent as a participant observer and doing research on and with that community, right? So that's what distinguishes basically a field school from a regular old study abroad is the intensive research, embedded research role that you play as a researcher, right? So um, the point is to not just to give you an interesting experience in a new place, but actually to train you as part of a research team. Every student that comes on this program would be part of a visual anthropology research team producing real research, right? Um, and that is, that, that is the difference. I'm guessing because this is, you're all majors. A couple of you walked in late. All anthropology majors still? Minor. Anthropology or minor. If you're a minor, I, I, I'm guessing you still know what the field school thing is and you kind of know all about that, right? Um, <clears throat> but yeah, any questions about what a field school is? I think we, we have a sense of that, right? Uh, bottom line is research is paramount, right? Um, so there, there, there are 12 credits that everybody's gonna take. Six of those credits are the 495R class that is required for graduation in our anthropology major. And that is basically the, the credit for that six credits 
maybe 10% of it is classroom based. The other 90% is you out in the community actually doing it. The 10% that's classroom based is us talking about the methods and actually workshopping what your research question is and what you should be doing on a day-to-day -day basis to ethnographically study that research question. So we do have a lecture, this seminar discussion component, but really that's 10% of it. The other 90% of it is you actually out in the community doing it, right? Which by the way, I should mention, Sierra's here. Sierra went with us on field school to Thailand last summer. So if you wanna, you know, once I leave the room or whatever, get a student's perspective, maybe we'll, maybe actually we'll turn it over to you and Brendan and I will pack and you can answer the questions <laughs> from a student's perspective. So visual anthropology. Um, I. I'm increasingly identifying as a visual anthropologist. So I've always done film and photography quite extensively in my research. Um, but what distinguishes visual anthropology from what visual anthropologists like to call logocentric anthropology, that's just a fancy word to talk about the anthropology that most of you take for granted as anthropology. In other words, anthropology based on the written word, where books and articles are the medium of scholarship that's produced and circulated. What, what distinguishes visual anthropology from logocentric anthropology is, is fundamentally the medium of scholarship, right? As opposed to books and articles, we're talking about photographic essays. Ethnographic film is probably the biggest one. Or even soundscapes, right? You've all listened to podcasts. A soundscape is it's kind of like a podcast. I think some podcasts verge in the soundscape territory. But imagine just going out and documenting the oral uh, a A U R A L, right? Oral, the oral sort of like ambiance or context of a place, right? Uh, that's what a soundscape is. And even if you're doing ethnographic film, you have to be highly conscientious and aware of the fact that sound is an integral part of that. I think it was Steven Spielberg that said that sound is at least 50% of a film, right? Uh, and many people think it's more like 60 or 70%. If you're ever to watch a film with that and just mute it, it's a completely different experience, right? Um, so anyway, visual anthropology distinguishes itself. And once again, if you're interested, um, A, if you're just interested in it, I'm teaching a course in visual anthropology next semester. If you're planning on attending this program, it is a prerequisite for that program, right? So, um, but we will get deeply into that. But uh, one of the things is that visual anthropology scholarship I didn't do a lot of it in the early part of my career because basically, I don't want to bore you with this, but getting tenure, it's ambiguous how ethnographic films and photo essays count for getting tenure. So for the first part of my career, I was focused on the articles and book chapters and so on to get tenure. But pretty much immediately after getting tenure, when I spent a year as a Fulbright scholar in China, that's when I really started taking a serious visual turn in my work and thinking about actually producing ethnographic film and for photographic essays and so on as a mode of scholarship. Uh, I've only directed one film so far, um, but I'm working on many others. So that, that kind of gives you a sense. So I basically decided be, because the medium of scholarship is different, you can't just go and hang out in a place and write field notes. I mean, visual anthropologists do that. But at some point, you have to spend time with a camera, with a voice recorder, you know, whether it's a cinematic camera or photographic camera, or whatever, you have to actually document that media if you want to produce something in that medium as the scholarship that you produce. And one thing I found is that I just love the creative side of it, right? Um, uh, it, it's just like I, I can't, I, I, I never cease to get excited about the, the, note, the things I'm learning as an ethnographic filmmaker, as an eth ethnographic photographer, it's really exciting. It is different, but I basically decided that it's different enough that I want to do one field school and kind of see how it goes that's focused primarily on visual anthropology. And basically, I'm only interested in accepting students who are willing to go along, me with, uh, go along with me on that, if that makes sense. So everything in the field school will be premised on <laughs> students doing projects that are visual anthropology based. And the primary media there, once again, is sound, film, and photography. Okay, yeah? So for a visual anthropology course, does it come off a lot like a documentary? Or is it different? Yeah, so an ethnographic film would be a mode of scholarship, right? A photographic essay would be a piece of scholarship. A soundscape could be, although soundscapes probably the least popular of those, but there are, there are, there are 
to the sonic anthropology is a very small subfield. But yeah, so the idea is that you would actually produce an ethnographic film for your thesis as opposed to a written thesis, if that makes sense. And let me just answer that question now. Yes, you can do that in the subsequent classes, okay? Um, it's not completely seamless, as Sierra's finding out. Sierra's actually doing an ethnographic film for her thesis, even though my field school last year was, let's call it mixed, between logocentric and visual anthropology, right? Um, because some, uh, I am the only self-identified visual anthropologist amongst our faculty, and I may or may not teach Anthropology 499, the senior thesis class. At the same time, my colleagues are open to it. It just requires an extra set of discussions with those faculty members. I mean, they might defer to me as to what constitutes like, you know, uh, uh, I, I might co-grade with them about what constitutes a good ethnographic film as opposed to a good written thesis and so on. So I'm, I'm not going to tell you that it's 100% seamless, but you can do it. And I will support you 100% of the way if you come on my field school, okay? Including after the field. Um, we can answer more questions about that if you like. So a couple of images, uh, you know, I could show you literally hundreds of these, but just to give you a sense of some of the street art. So these are just kind of walls around town, right? Uh, reclaim the Republic, right? Uh, a lot of it is really just straight up and in your face. This was uh, a <laughs> the notion of ending British rule. So thinking about Northern Ireland, not as a separate country, but as a currently colonized space by the British, right? So you can see what's going on here. Uh, <laughs> Catalonia had just under, undertaken the separatist movement that was squashed by the Spanish government at the time. You'll see all sorts of support you know, solid solidarity with Palestine, with Palestinians, with Catalonia and other oppressed groups that see themselves as occupied by illegitimate governments, right? I mean, this is this stuff is all over the city. Um, this is an Irish mural. Uh, this is one of the famous hunger strikers, right? He was arrested by the British for crimes and they were claiming that these are not criminals, these are political prisoners. And, um, you know, they uh, went on hunger strike while in, they would argue, uh, custody, you know, military custody of the British government, right? Um, uh, PSNI is the Police Service of Northern Ireland. I'll let you guess what FT means. <laughs> um, there's also a lot of, uh, you know, uh, murals and sectarianism, right? People in Northern Ireland, your average person is just sick and tired of troubles, but they also know that it's like political division in American society times 100. We know that we're not just getting over it tomorrow, right? Um, but there are, there's a lot of wall art that's trying to get past the sectarian art and say, we need to move on as a society. I love this image about ending sectarianism. Um, I, sh I didn't have the other image, but this is a, uh, this is a sort of... Uh, this isn't specifically about the troubles. It's sort of like lauding British military history during World War II. But of course, during the summer we were there, this image itself was burned with a, a vandal, uh, uh, basically with a fire. Uh, here's some Irish images. Maybe I'll just kind of skip through these. No surrender. That's on a shank hill. So that's a, that's a Protestant image, right? We will never surrender to the uh, Republican terrorists would be their perspective on it, right? The Irish Republican terrorists, right? Uh, and of course, the other side of that is we're colonized by these illegitimate British colonizers. Uh, and there's also, you know, there's the sectarianism, there's the political divides, but also Belfast is just an incredibly deeply religious place. So we actually had students in 2018, I had a student working in a Jehovah's Witness congregation. Uh, we had a, bunch, so a couple of students working with street preachers that weren't about the politics. They were really about just out there, you know, bringing people to Jesus and so on. It's just Northern Ireland is a deeply religious society and it's an incredibly interesting one in many regards that even reach beyond the troubles. Um, okay, so let me, I'm getting close to wrapping up here, but I wanted to go through some of the logistics of it. Uh, this text is a bit small. I think what I'll do, I think I've sent most of you, but I just barely added this flyer here. So let's open that up. Might be slightly more interesting. Uh, this is the official flyer that you'll find on the Kennedy Center when that page goes live. Um, and it has more or less the same information, 
maybe in more concise form than what's on my website. But the dates currently, uh, 4th of June to 12th of August, those are not set in stone. Those are tentative, although I think they're getting pretty close. I think they're, it's going to be pretty close to those that time frame. Uh, that is about 10 weeks, I believe. Uh, it's a full semester, right? It's not a spring term or a summer term. It's a summer semester is what the university actually calls it because it's a semester that spans the entire spring, summer. The, th the important thing for you is that it's an entire semester worth of credit towards your major, right? So we're talking about 12 credits. And since I'm talking about that, those courses are six credits of 495R, right? So that's the ethnographic field project that is required for graduation. Everybody has to do that. Minors, you can do any credits, right? Um, so any credits count. By the way, if you're, you have any friends that are looking for a minor, if you do my program and my prep class, that's a minor, full stop. So that's 16 credits. 12 credits in the field, the visual anthropology course, and there's a one credit prep class where we're all getting ready to go to Ireland together. I'll tell you about that in a second. But the other two courses are Moral and Ritual Institutions. It's a fancy name. It's basically Anthropology of Religion, right? And then there's a Culture and History of Northern Ireland module in the course. So you basically walk away with this with a People's class, a Systems class, and the 495R Ethnographic Field School class. Yeah? Is it required that we're full-time um, this? Like, for example, if I had all the um, credits that I Um, so for various reasons, everybody, uh, for the most part is going to take these classes. If you have a compelling reason to do something different, um, I would actually probably be more inclined to have you do this and let's petition to get one of those peoples to count as assistants. And I think I can make that petition work if that makes sense. Um, I don't want to talk about everybody's individual situations now. I am a little bit open to modifying the course offerings if you have a compelling reason, right? Um, there are limits to that. And part of those limits have to do with the fact that um, if you don't take all these courses uh, and you don't pay the tuition for them, see, the nice thing about programs here at BYU is 100% of the tuition you pay for these courses actually gets sent back to the budget that will pay for your housing the local guest lectures at in Northern Ireland and so on. It's actually very generous. If you look at a semester program like this at pretty much any other university where you're getting a full semester, compare a full semester program, you know, it's pretty rare that you'll have anything south of $10,000, right? Um, and that's because BYU is willing to redirect that tuition to our program budget to cover your expenses. So for reasons related to that, you do need to take 12 credits uh, and I'm open, I'm potentially open to flexibility, but I have my limits, right? Because I'm directing a program with 10 to 15 students and there's only so much that I can humanly do, right? Um, uh, but, but I do, but yeah. You'd also want to take those because they can really help for your... That's actually the more important thing. And that's why I'd be inclined to have you take that class and let's petition to get it to count for assistance class uh, because you're not going to want to miss the lectures probably by, I'm working with a couple of colleagues there, and we may actually join up with Queen's University, Belfast. Uh, there's a professor there, Dominic Bryan, who's a, just one of the foremost experts on the history of the Troubles and, you know, can take you to the coolest places in Belfast to actually see and talk about things. Like, you don't want to miss that in terms of being trained. All of this, so both of these courses, by the way, the, the 390R course, the Culture and History of Northern Ireland, and the Anthropology of Religion course, all, those are not separate things, right? That is specifically designed to give you the training to understand important theories in the anthropology of religion and the culture and history of the place where you're actually doing ethnography. That's why I'm not particularly inclined to have you do other coursework outside of that, because to do a good visual ethnographic project for 495, you need a deep contextual understanding of the history and the politics and the culture of Northern Ireland, and you also need to understand some fundamentals about the anthropology of religion. Does that make sense? Yeah. Have any of you taken 430 already? That's a good thing, because you'll take it in Northern Ireland. Right? Yeah. I noticed in this video, maybe I haven't checked this enough, but some of the conflicts was the conflicts for 
program are on my map. Like the camera is here for that. So I'm wondering if you were aware of that. Uh, so the only one that's in absolute prerequisite well okay there's actually two um the one is the visual anthropology course and let's talk about that yeah so right here. okay so let me explain this real quick i assume you're talking about this right here right um the visual anthropology course it doesn't have its course number yet i proposed it last year and for bureaucratic reasons it's still a 490r but hopefully next year it'll have its own customizable number. And I know that 490R classes, when you register for them, it's not obvious what they are because of the way the website is set up and blah, blah, blah. I, I understand that. It's still a 490R, but it is a distinct visual anthropology course. The reason that's a prerequisite is because um, Sierra will tell you all about her travails trying to learn kind of the basics of shooting, like a, obtaining a proper exposure on a camera, let alone thinking about the finer issues of how being in a space with a camera affects your role as an ethnographer in relation to the people that you're talking to and observing, right? Um, I wanna get that stuff under our belts here on campus so that when we go to Belfast, we can focus on actually doing, you all know how to do an exposure, right? You obtain a proper exposure on a camera. You all have already thought about some of these finer points of what it means to be a visual anthropologist and what some of the standards and expectations or controversial issues are in visual anthropology. I don't have to teach those to you in the field. We've talked about it for a semester on campus. When we get to Belfast, we can just hit the ground running. Because what I envision is that this group of students as a team, we will probably less have individual, I'm open to individualized projects, but you know, from experience, and, and Sierra will tell you, because I had a couple of times I needed to go shoot some material, and it wasn't Sierra or Sarah's project, but I said, you two start clocking hours because we're going up to the mountain to film the apocalyptos, right? Because <laughs> you need two or three people with different cameras, different angles, audio, and all of those different things to get the production quality footage that you'll want to bring home so that you can cut a, a high quality film from that that makes sense. So what I'm imagining is actually, and I'm, I know I'm bebopping and scatting all over the place here, uh, but what I'm imagining is that we have a team of students probably working on larger scale projects, right? Uh, maybe an entire ethnographic film where we're all chunking out a piece of it, right? Where as we start to do our research and our field work, we start to imagine, oh, there's this kind of narrative arc we see. How about the three or four of you focus on that part of it? The three or four of you focus on that part the three or four of you for, as a team focus on that part, and maybe we stitch together an entire feature film. I don't know. Um, we kind of won't know till we get there, but I want that team of students well-trained in visual anthropology before we get there, so I don't have to train you how to use a camera while we're in the field. You already know how to use a camera. You know some of these ideas about visual anthropology. We're just going out and doing it, and we can focus on what it means to do visual anthropology in Belfast while we're in Belfast, if that makes sense, rather than the basics of it. Now, are you saying that that visual anthropology class doesn't show up on my map? No, it's the three Okay, so that doesn't exist yet. Uh, the reason it doesn't exist yet, sometimes it's a second block class, sometimes it's a full semester class. That one credit class, and you do need to know that if you're accepted in this program, you, do, you will have to take that class. What that entails is basically it's a logistics course where we're getting ready for Belfast. You have some required briefings by the Kennedy Center, safety security briefing. Um, I don't know what are the other ones. Kennedy Center policy briefings. We make sure your paperwork for your international student insurance is in order. We make sure everybody knows what to pack for Belfast. Uh, we at some point actually literally divide up very expensive camera gear and say, you're responsible to show up in Belfast with that, you know, $5,000 camera or whatever, right? I'll probably carry the expensive ones, uh, which I did last time. <clears throat> but, um, you know, we basically get all of those logistics in place so that when we literally all just land in Belfast, we can hit the ground running and we don't have to worry about all those logistics. That's what that one credit class is. It's sort of to get to help us get to know each other and get ready for the program. 
uh, there's not going to be a ton of reading in that one credit class because it is just one credit class, but there will be some of those logistical preparations. Does that make sense? Uh, and it's not listed yet, which is why it's not showing up on my map. So um, it probably won't be listed until I have a pretty good idea of who's in the program. I don't want to make you drop a three credit class that you have to take for your major to take this one credit class. So there will be some flexibility in terms of when that's listed. Um, so don't worry about scheduling conflicts for it because it literally isn't on the schedule yet. Okay. But the visual anthropology one is. Okay. Uh, just by show of hands, who's registered for that visual anthropology class already? Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Um, yeah. Uh, we did dates. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, how quickly would you say is uh, 442, the ethnographic research design one? Uh, if you're a major, it's required. It's okay, so I, that that's not a program requirement for me. If I get a film student who wants to come on my program, I'm not going to make them take 442. Right. If you're an anthro major, you need to take 442 before you do field school because it is a prerequisite for 495, but we're willing to waive that prerequisite for non-majors. Uh, we don't want to waive it for majors. And the reason is you need that method strength. I've taught students who have done 442 after the field. And yeah, they get more out of 442, but they're also way less prepared for their field work when they do their field work, if that makes sense. Yeah. And the visual anthropology class has three credits, right? It is, yeah. It's a regular three credit. It's a systems class, right? So any other questions on, is there anything on YouTube? Nope. I think I have that chat open. I can't use a mess with my left hand. Um, all right, so cost, uh, this cost right here, that is inclusive of tuition, right? So what is tuition like, 3,300? Neighborhood of, right? So. That's 30, that, that let, let's say for ease of numbers, that's $7,000 total, right? That includes that, let's say $3,000 that goes paid as regular tuition, and then 4,000 would be paid to the Kennedy Center in installments. Basically, once you're accepted into the program, um, they will start, that you can work with them in terms of, you know, the, the scheduling of those installments and whatnot, but basically that the program fee is paid to the Kennedy Center, Tuition is paid as regular tuition, and all that adds up to the 7000 to 7500 right? If we have more students, that brings the cost down. There's an economy of scale there, right? Um, but uh, it does, the big thing that it does not include is flight to and from Northern Ireland, right? So that is basically your life in Ireland, um, in Northern Ireland, uh, in terms of, or I should say, it's not your life. It, what it is, it's your program, including housing in Northern Ireland while you're there, right? So, you know, um, hiring the get local guest lectures. And we may actually pay some tuition to Queens and actually have you do a week of formal coursework at Queens. As uh, with uh, Professor Dominic Bryan, we're still working out those logistics. But, um, you know, they have a three-week summer school. The first week is focused on the culture, history, and politics of Northern Ireland, so we may team up with them on that. Um, but yeah, that cost is, is that, that, I just want to clarify that that includes tuition. Now, a couple of things on financial aid. All of you are majors or minors. Uh, sometimes the minors slip to the bottom of the priority list, but we do have, fine, you, I, I, I can predict with a fairly high degree of certainty that you all will receive probably some substantial financial aid from the department to help you offset field school costs. We receive, um, you know, tens of thousands of, and when I say 10, I think last year, maybe it was like 30 or $40,000 in experiential learning funds to use in our department. Uh, and we prioritize field school students for those funds, right? Um, Hopefully in the future, we know about those and those specific amounts earlier rather than later. But in the past, what was it? March before you all knew exactly how much you were getting. You knew money was coming, but you didn't know. Was it? Yeah. I think I, I think I told you before then, like, we, I know you're going to get this amount, but it might not have shown up until May or whatever. Right. Um, anyway, but uh, from my experience, you know, 
the financial aid that you get just from our department ranges from a thousand on the low end to, you know, 2000 is probably a little more typical slash and maybe on the high end 2500. If you have multiple sources, if you have a double major and you get some experiential learning money from another department, you might be in the three to 4000 range for financial aid, right? So that's just to give you a sense of the, uh, the historical number. We don't know those numbers until the university says, here's your experiential learning money, right? Um, but I, I have a sense that we're probably going to be more on top of that this year. We've gotten back into a more regular post-COVID rhythm bureaucratically in our department. Uh, so I, I think we'll probably know earlier in winter semester, but it won't be until winter semester that we know exactly how much financial aid is going to be distributed to field school students. But I'm just trying to give you a sense, right? The other thing I would suggest is you can apply for, uh, there's a Gilman uh, scholarship that you can apply for. You can Google that. I think there's a deadline in March. March. So that's late. You wouldn't, You can't bank on it, right? You pretty much have to be planning to go already. Um, but you can apply for it. Um, there's also stuff for the Kennedy Center. When you do the Kennedy Center application, I believe there's going to be a box that you check to say, I want to be considered for Kennedy Center financial aid. That's separate from our department, right? Um, uh, so yeah, and we do have a a modest but growing sociocultural anthropology field school fund that will possibly bring this cost down as well. It probably won't be distributed directly to you, but it might dip that cost below 7,000. We don't know what that looks like again yet. So I'm, these are my most liberal assumptions that I'm willing to hang my hat on, you know, worst case scenario. And that's before financial aid and it includes tuition. That's what I'm trying to tell you. But I think from my experience in the past, having run eight field schools in the past, uh, I don't think any of you are going to be paying 7,000 out of pocket with no help from the department, if that makes sense. Okay. And any, any, uh, any tuition scholarships you have from the university that are available during spring, summer, this is a tuition bearing program. So it's eligible for all of that. Pell grants, federal financial aid, all of that can go towards this, to be clear. It's just like a semester on campus. If you have scholarship funds available, it chips down that cost, right? Any questions on that? Okay. Um, da, 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 housing, we're probably mostly gonna be at Queens University Housing. What we did in 2018 was basically each of you had your own individual room with bathroom, right? And it had a little desk, a little bed, a little bathroom all in a private space and then a communal kitchen living room area, right? Um, we did have some students stay with host families. It was complicated for various reasons. Um, <laughs> we're not going to talk about that right now. Uh, the students were part of the complications and some of those issues. Uh, but uh, we may or may not have host families, but most, more likely than not, we'll probably have all the students staying at Queens University Housing. So um, at the same time, you know, we, uh, we, we aim to build relationships with people in the community where you might not be sleeping in their houses, but you'll be hopefully spending a lot of time with them in their houses. One of the big events that we had our students go to last year, which I'm hoping we can do again, was called uh, Summer Madness. It was this largely Protestant run religious summer camp for youth but they were trying to really make it sort of like a bridge building so that the Catholics were in the minority, but they were invited and they're really trying to make this a positive, kind of get the next generation to become friends type of religious summer camp. And if they allow us to, it would be a fantastic sort of micro narrative in a film because the, the experience that our students had, our students volunteered at Summer Madness. And it was, uh, it, it was I, I didn't go myself. I you know read all the field notes about the students going, uh, when they went and volunteered and whatnot, but if if they allowed us to film, and I kind of think that they might, it would be a it would be a fantastic experience. But you know, those are the types of things we want to be out in the community, spending our time with people and getting them used to us hanging out, but with the camera rolling a lot of the time, right? Um, but yeah, uh, courses cost uh, travel. You will buy your own flights, and we'll talk about that in the prep class. Uh, okay, so I don't know what will change. I can tell you the 
field school pol travel policy as of last year coming just out of the pandemic was that uh, you had to get your flights approved. You had to buy them through tra BYU Travel, and I had to approve your arrival dates. Everybody had to arrive basically on the same day. You could pick your own flight, but you could not travel before or after the program full stop, right? Like the university wanted to monitor your flights to and from most, in most cases, Utah, or if your family's in Colorado, you're flying from Colorado, they wanted to see the entire flight and your parents were not allowed to meet you there and travel with you afterwards. They said, we'll take exceptions, but we're gonna say no to all of them. I feel like it's not the same world it was a year ago, right? In terms of like the pandemic and, and stuff. And all of this, by the way, is rooted in the university wanting to send students abroad again, but doing it in the most conservative way, legally conservative way that was least likely to create health issues. The, the last thing that they want is a student stuck in another country when they were traveling for their study abroad program, like stuck on COVID quarantine or whatever, right? I don't know if that's going to change. I just can't tell you. I'm going to go to a director's information meeting in a couple of weeks. I might have more information about that, but at least last year, all I'm telling you is there was no allowed travel before or after the program. You will fly to and from the U.S. on specific dates that they monitor, and they're going to be basically those dates, right? In 2018, we had travel week in the middle, and we let our students kind of, they had to approve it with me, but they could travel in pairs. Some students went to Italy, Croatia, Croatia London. I don't know if we're going to be allowed travel week this year. And, and, and I haven't built it in the schedule because I've kind of assumed that the travel that we do as a group will be the travel that you do. We are planning on as a group and going around a bit to the Republic of Ireland and definitely around Northern Ireland to places like Derry. Um, by the way, if you want to you immerse yourself in Northern Ireland, Netflix uh, series, Dairy Girls, there's some vulgar language, but it gives you a good sharp hit of that witty Northern Irish folksy approach to life. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did, I went on a study abroad over the summer and uh -huh. there was one person on our trip whose parent met them and they went to a place, but Again, like, um, yeah. I, that All I was told is you can ask for those exceptions, but they're going to be hard to, it's going to hard, be hard. That person must have got an exception, right? And again, I, I would think that they're lightening up about that, right? Because there were, we did have a, we did have one student get COVID in Thailand. We had to go check her into a hotel and bring her food for five days, but it was fine. Other than that, she got kind of bored and had to watch a lot of Netflix, but what do you do, right? That was the COVID protocol in Thailand. But, um, but I also think that, I don't know, I think things are normalizing more. So, but I can't tell you what to expect because I don't know how the policies changed. So we will learn extensively about how those policies changed in the one credit prep class because we'll have people from the Kennedy Center giving us those policies and making us sign documents agreeing to follow them and so on. Um, will the field school prep class cover the IAS? Um, it's the same the thing. Course? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, oh, yep. Uh, we call it, we, we don't do it as an IAS 201R. We do it as 390R for minors because a minor is 16 credits. If you do 12 credits plus three credits plus one credit, 16, right? So, uh, but yeah, rather than offering it as an IAS class and asking you to petition to count that as a minor, we just, I do mine as a 390R, so it counts towards a minor for any minors who want to do that. Let's see. Um, okay, I, I will say this, since many of you may not know this, but BYU's policy is probably going to remain the same. You do have to be vaccinated to go on an ISB program, full stop. So if you have issues with that, talk to the Kennedy Center. That's a university policy. So. Um, Check your passport now and make sure that it doesn't expire in the next I mean, I'll tell you that when you get accepted into the program, but if you're planning on going anywhere, you almost always have to have six months available on your passport expiration after the end of your trip, right? So you have to think about when you're planning on coming back, do you have six months available before expiration then? And if you do, they'll let you in the country. If you don't, they might say, sorry, go get a passport and come back to us, right? 
Um, application process, we talked about it. Uh, I will, again, some of you walked in late, but you're all on that email list where I sent out the information. Did any of you not get that? Did any of you get it from the department and not directly from me? Okay, so you're all on my 19 email email list. Okay, if any of you are out there in YouTube land and you're not, email me, jhickman at byu.edu, and I will put add you to that list. But when that application is live, you're the first ones that are going to know about it. Okay. Um, as of now, assuming they get it up soon enough, the application deadline is going to be, it's not an intensive application. It'll probably take you a half, I don't know, half hour. Yeah. Something like that. I do. There is a statement of purpose. I do want you to tell me why you want to go to a visual anthropology field school, right? What's your interest in that? I don't expect you to have any background in photographic work, cinematography or anything. I don't expect you to have a background. I do expect you to be interested and eager and wanting to learn and to take my visual anthropology class where you will get experience in photography, cinematography, um, you know, audio engineering and so on, right? And specifically thinking about why we would do those things in the context of doing anthropology, right? Um, that's what's different about my visual anthropology class from a class you would take in the theater and media arts department, right? Is because we're thinking about why we would do these things as anthropologists to understand, you know, cultural worlds and so on, right? 